Okay, <clears throat> this is the fourth lecture in this 42 plus lectures on creating a sustainable international civilization. So this one is about applying Aristotle's virtues to the problem of corruption. So um, when I was in Indonesia on my Fulbright, people in many different schools or many different um, disciplines within my school wanted me to come and give a talk. And um, I, didn't, I didn't have expertise in what they wanted me to talk about, but especially in cases where they were organizing a conference and they wanted it to be an international conference. <laughs> And they needed me because then it would be an international conference <laughs> or me and someone from Malaysia or something. So, okay, you know, I wanted to do what I could. So um, this video and the next one uh, are about, this one's about applying Aristotle's virtues to the problem of corrupt, corruption. And then the next one is about terrorism, which was really a stretch, I thought. But in both cases, um, I think it's a good thing because it made me realize, okay, this is what I'm really trying to get at, is that I've given you in the last two lectures a system of virtues and vices uh, that you can use. It should be in the back of your mind as you uh, confront all sorts of problems, including corruption, including terrorism. But the basic framework gives you some insight about how corruption occurs, how many, many different types of corruption there are, how many, many ways there are to go wrong, Aristotle said that there are many ways to go wrong. And he also says, but only one way to go right. So that's something controversial about his model is that he says there is one best thing to do in any given situation. Now, that doesn't mean we should be arguing all the time because there's only one person that's right. It just means theoretically, it is true. There is one best choice that would maximize flourishing. So the reason you need to say that as a point of theory is there is one ultimate goal. If there's one ultimate goal, human flourishing, and it is a natural goal because flourishing has a natural foundation, in theory, there is one best thing to do. But, my gosh, human affairs are imprecise, Aristotle says. And it's barbaric to try to get more precision than you can in human affairs. And that's where I think the social sciences got it wrong. They're trying to treat people according to their behaviors, and they can modify behavior and Human affairs are not that precise. Partly they're not because we have ideas. It's ideas of good and evil, justice and injustice that drive our behavior. And we can have some really crazy ideas that do not lead to flourishing at all. So it, we're it, unpredictable in that way. We're suicidal. We're, you know, we can be really crazy. But we're by nature, we seek understanding, which is why we have to have, we are driven by ideas, because in theory, the universe is understandable and we're capable of understanding it. So, in theory, there is one best thing to do. In practice, you have to cut people a lot of slack and you have to say, well, as far as we know, there are three options, and we will choose this one, not because it would be best in a vacuum, 
but because given the circumstances, it seems like the best in the situation. And we, there might be people who disagree, but they, they might come to the point where they flip a coin because they have gone through all the arguments over and over. But still, in theory, there's the best thing to do. So you have to have that as your guideline, but you cannot let them, let that make you obsessive, fixating on one solution and not going along with promoting the solution that collectively uh, was agreed upon and supporting it because it's things will get worse if somebody um, undermines a decision that was the collective decision. The social fabric gets unraveled and ultimately we have to try and have the most stable, accurate social fabric we can have. Um, so this is about corruption and Aristotle's virtues. The other point is that I'm giving you this overall view without any specifics about a specific case of corruption and then about the expertise that would be necessary to make a decision in any specific case. It's just it gives you the general framework, which has to be true before you know every particular decision situation occurs within this much broader context. The broader context can set up the fact that this is the problem you're going to solve. How is it that we got to this situation in the first place? That'll have to do with all the background stuff. How is it then, what kind of expertise is necessary to solve this problem will also be related to the broader context. So I think you'll understand that once I get started. So, okay. Um, again, it might seem a little redundant for me to keep bringing up these virtues, but if they really are about life, we bring these virtues, we bring this background to any decision we make because it's who we are. So you can test it for yourself, see if it makes sense. This is the original reason for this set of lectures, but anyone who comes to these lectures uh, from a different country, a different uh, orientation, different political philosophy, uh, it, it has ramifications way beyond the US and Indonesia. Okay, so the basic framework is self-control, not too much, not too little for the right reason in the right way, because it's the right thing to do. No other reason. You don't, you're not looking for external rewards and punishments. You've internalized virtue, courage, generosity, magnanimity, um, anger, ambition, pride, sociability, self-knowledge. The political virtues, living moderately, public funded educational institutions should teach children virtues, have assignments that require children to actually exercise virtues. Families at home should value education and also uh, exercise the moral virtues. Legislation, distribution of social goods, punishment of criminals, equity, applying the laws in particular situations. Now, justice and injustice in a democracy specifically, but it's also true in a monarchy to uh, most extent, and also aristocracy. So in every relationship that involves inequality, so in a democracy, um, Aristotle assumed people are by nature unequal. And for the most part, most of our relationships are relationships of inequality. Parent, child, older sibling, younger sibling, 
teacher, student, coach, athlete, um, religious leader, parishioner, political leader, sub, uh, citizen. All these things are unequal, but we have some relationships, some friendships that are between equals. It's just in Aristotle's view, you start out with the basic framework is inequality. And the issue is how to use your authority for the well-being of the people over whom you have it. That's what justice is. In our American democracy, we assume people are by nature equal, and then we have to justify all the inequalities. So I don't I'm don't think it matters what your starting point is. It's just that inequality is not necessarily the worst starting point. But you have to emphasize, then the emphasis is justice is rule for the well-being of the ruled. Um, and injustice is using your authority to amass, to help your friends and harm your enemies, to get more money, power, status, whatever. That's what injustice is. So if you have the power, you can use it. If they use it to exploit people who depend on them, that's injustice. In a just society, all relationships, people are always using their authority for the well-being of others. And that occurs within the family, okay? Are parents treating their children as extension of their own ego? Are they treating them as their servants? Are they treating them as trying to force the kid to be a chip off the old block or whatever? Are they um, excessively violent? Are they excessively self-indulgent? I mean, <laughs> there's many, many different ways that parents abuse their authority. And of course, this is gossip or we chatter about this. A conscientious parent will think about it, but that's the basic structure. What authority do I have and am I using it for the benefit of my child so my child can flourish or my grandchild? Okay. Neighbors, friends, all of them, all of them, all of these are um, relationships mostly of inequality. Um, so, in a just, the goal is always developing a higher quality of life. Then there's relationships with people we don't know personally. We live with them as citizens under a common body of law. So lawyer-client privilege, uh, legislator and citizen, judge and um, petitioner, right? person who needs uh, the judgment of a judge, the police and the people who are being punished, the military and the soldiers are the military brass, the leaders deciding on situations of war and keeping their soldiers out of harm's way in whenever possible. Or are rich people sending troops to war for wealth? That's an abuse of power. Or just for domination of other countries? That's an abuse of power. Or just to gratify their own egos because they're capable. They have the power to do it. A huge, huge abuses of power. Um, when people, corruption is when people abuse their authority, right? It can happen at any, at any level. Doctors, are they, are they using their authority to actually promote the health of their clients? Or are they doing it to get rich? Um, are they trying to prevent their uh, patients from getting sick or they actually don't care because if they eat the wrong food or they don't exercise, then they will have them for a patient longer. They will diagnose 
uh, drugs that the pharmaceutical company gives them a little bit of a bribe <laughs> to prescribe a drug to their patients. I mean, there's so many ways that the system, people can get corrupted, the whole system can be corrupted, the laws can be corrupted, the ways the laws are applied can be corrupted, the way the laws are enforced can be corrupted. Laws to do with anything, laws to do with education, laws to do with medicine, military, religion even. Okay. Corruption in the economic sector, right? So every profession can be corrupted by money. The economic con uh, sector of society is you know, more, even more prone because the point of a business is to make money. So then the judgments are, do you corrupt your business in order to make more money? Or do you run a business where you're selling a decent product at a decent price and you're treating your employees decently and you're treating your customers decently, right? Um, or do you set it all up just so you, the person at the top, can get rich? So even richer. So there are all these relationships. Um, there are the products that emerge from natural necessity, right? Healthy foods, clothes, shelter. And then there are the products that, there are products that appeal to need. And then there's the ones that appeal to greed, vanity, pride, gluttony, lust, you name it. There's products that are designed to um, trigger irrational desires, extremes, vices, and the whole product would not exist like high heeled pointed toed shoes, <laughs> shoes that ruin someone's feet. Huh? Like <laughs> that is a corrupt product. Shoes themselves aren't corrupt. It's the kind of shoe that's corrupt. Usually the ones that destroy your feet are the ones that make the most money. So everybody, no matter what place they are in the economic system or what profession they have that they get paid to do can be corrupted. Um, can products use natural resources that can be replaced, recyclable, sustainable, or not? And then in a consumer society, the economy depends upon uh, freedom, people buying things they don't need that harm their bodies, that corrupt their desires, that corrupt their relationships, that pit people against each other instead of bringing people together. So if everybody, if people have unlimited desires, they're not going to want to be generous. And if they're not generous, they don't create trust and goodwill. If all they care about is themselves, then their their people around them assume they don't care about them. You know, they don't have goodwill. They're just competing against other people. Um, owners can exploit workers. Salaries are too low, the working conditions can't negotiate contracts, too many hours. Um, there's lots of ways that owners can exploit workers. And then the question is, do workers have an option? Or do owners get together and negotiate, tell each other what salaries they're going to pay so that the worker can't go to another uh, employer and get a better job. So there's lots of ways they control the market. Again, that's totally corrupt. Um, okay, how else? Business owners exploit customers in their advertisements. They can deceive customers. They can do pro uh, poor product, you know, their low quality product, dangerous products, or Built-in obsolescence, the product stops working pretty quickly. They have to get another one. Um, exploit natural resources, don't replace them, create waste, hazardous waste. 
exploit politicians so they pay for political campaigns so that when their um, politician gets elected, they tell the politician what laws to make and what laws not to make to favor their interests. Um, taxes exist to pay to promote the common good and to meet common needs that can't be met through private businesses. So when businesses, because of greed, take control of the political system and the politicians are bought out, the politicians will not set up a tax system that actually benefits the common good because they've been instructed by their campaign donors to, to make laws that don't benefit the common good, that just benefit them. Corruption of government officials. Salaries can be too high. They can abuse their power by giving their contracts to friends, by having a no bid contract, which means there's no competition, and to having no transparency. Um, the legislation can be bad laws, they can favor the rich, or they can be not enough laws. In our legislature right now, 2024, the last few years, Congress has made fewer laws than, I guess, since 1946, or, you know, just notoriously few laws in a very, very complicated culture and economic system where we really need more and more laws because more and more products that are more and more impactful, like social media, AI, are coming onto the market. So the legislators need to keep up with this and put some bare bones, minimum regulation on it, and nothing's getting passed because of the bribes of the, of the economic leaders. Now, in the U.S., this is not illegal, and it's not called a bribe. <laughs> it's just a political campaign donation. Um, then there's the judges favoring the rich. Then there's the political, like the in our country, the president appoints federal judges and the Supreme Court judges. And then when the president appoints judges that just favor uh, Republican businesses, uh, that's what you get. I mean, it's very difficult at this point because Republican presidents have appointed judges that uh, don't care about monopolies and they protect fossil fuel companies. And so our system is really falling apart because the control by the rich is undermining our ability to um, compete internationally, as I said, because monopolies um, only favor very few people and everybody else gets poor and doesn't buy products. And so other businesses go out of business because it's just nobody can buy anything except the people on the top. So it's, it's a self-destructive system once the concentration of wealth gets too extreme. Um, enforcing the laws can get corrupted. Corruption of people who run for laws. Do you have to have a lot of money? Do you have to get your money from your donors? <clears throat> Journalism gets corrupted because journalists, in order to make money, they have to run sensational stories rather than what people need to know. They can distort the facts. And of course, in the US, Fox News is notorious for that. Rupert Murdoch doesn't pretend to care about anything but money. Uh, he's not, you know, it should, should be obvious to people they shouldn't want to watch that uh, network because the guy who runs it is completely <laughs> greed driven. Um, people can be manipulated, misinformed, uninformed. So we know all that. That's kind, but I'm just, all I'm doing is putting it on a grid and saying these are all connected. Um, what about Indonesia? Indonesia has Panchasila. So belief in God, 
just and civilized humanity, humanitarianism, unity and diversity, democracy through deliberation and social justice. So from birth, children are raised to obey their parents. Parents model the love of virtue they see. Um, children model the love of virtue they see in their parents. Um, oh, parents model their parents. Children learn from watching their parents. So it's a generational thing. And that's that's how you really internalize virtue. You have multiple generations, extended family, and they're all acting virtuously. Well, you know, most extended families don't work quite that way, which is why you have tragedy and you have conflict. Um, tragedies are about people who actually have bonds of affection with each other because these are the people who affect, mold other people's characters. Um, so um, all of that is important. And how does it get corrupted? So how could Indonesians as uh, teach, you know, the Department of Education, Department of Religious Affairs, how could they come up with a curriculum that would support the kind of virtues necessary to maintain a free society, a strong social fabric, a strong middle class. So you tell stories about Hindu heroes, Muhammad, Jesus, Buddha, tribal religious. Uh, and, and so you, if you tell these stories and kids hear the stories and they all are stories about self-control, courage, um, ambition, honor, they're all based examples of those kinds of virtues. Then the kids just grow up assuming the basic message is the same and they're not going to be intolerant. Um, okay. Also, they tell stories that leaders have similar experiences, good leaders, right? So they show stories of good leadership. Uh, children can tell their own stories. So children can tell stories, they can write stories, they can draw pictures about stories in their lives that represent these virtues. Um, link the stories to Aristotle's virtues. And um, that's how they would learn to read, write, and using types of stories. So they would basically be sort of mythologizing their own lives. So when you mythologize uh, your experiences, what you're doing is you're noticing that a certain experience isn't just about you. It's actually represents a pattern. So like a child, you could tell a story of, I know there's a story of when Jesus got mad. He got mad at the people in the synagogue who had set up uh, little shops to make money. So they're selling um, little trinkets to go and put on the altar to try and get a few, score a few, few points for God. And Jesus was mad. And he said, you've made the synagogue into a marketplace. Just a, he's against greed once again, but it's about greed and it's about anger. So then a little kid could think about, oh, I got angry the other day, right? At my sister. And then you go, well, was it for a good reason like Jesus? Or was it for a bad reason, right? Or did you overreact? And then they can start to think about it and they can tell a story or they could just think of a story of their anger. They can write it down and then the teacher could go, okay, now, was this anger for the right reason? Like, who are you angry at? Why? Was that the appropriate way to communicate? Was that the right thing to do? Or do you think you could have just explained Um what you're upset about without getting too angry. Um, definitely you would not want to hit anybody. Jesus got out a whip and he uh, he started taking down the, the tables and the stuff. He didn't whip a person. 
So just things like that, that wouldn't be hard to do. And it would basically weave together in a child's imagination and in their storytelling, their inner dialogue, they would just have conversations inside about the virtues. And if parents are actually exhibiting those virtues, then that would all, it would all come together. Now in the US, I have students, I had a student last semester, she loved the My Little Pony stories. <laughs> and actually my granddaughter likes My Little Pony. Well, okay. Um, or the unicorn story. I, there's, I don't live close to them and unfortunately, so I don't know that much. But she was saying, yeah, those My Little Pony stories, they are about these conflicts that are about Aristotle's virtues. And I was thinking, yeah, I'm sure the people who wrote them knew that. <laughs> so it's good that they know that. It's good. Sometimes they don't know them as Aristotle's virtues. They just pick it up in some other context. But I guess my claim is that Aristotle probably gives the most comprehensive list from which you could write My Little Pony stories. You might get a lot more ideas. Or if you're from Indonesia, maybe you have some other character from folk tales. And there's a number of stories or Mohammed stories. Um, uh, let's see, there's a there, there are these legends. There was a guy named Tommy Dapola who used to publish these beautiful, beautiful children's books with these legends. And they always had these sort of moral stories. Um, but there's some of them we have uh, called Breer Rabbit. And they're stories about arrogance and pride. And, and children hear those and they can laugh but they also learn to think critically and they learn because the characters are, are vicious or they're manipulating each other or they're misperceiving a situation. And so the kid actually can learn to think critically because they realize that the characters should be thinking more critically. So there's just lots of ways to use stories to develop character. Um, but again, I think Aristotle's list of virtues and vices is a great place to look for plots. Um, then in the, the education for youth, so you should develop, work with developmental psychologists and they can make informed recommendations about what kind of teaching and learning works best for children at each age and stage. And there's a lot of stuff out there about that. And as they get older, they should be taught to think critically. Um, they also should learn how religious leaders can be corrupt by, corrupted by money and how politicians can be corrupted. Older children need to imagine themselves in situations that require them to choose corruption or to risk losing their jobs. They will probably have that situation sometime in adult life. So to have gone over it in high school and had conversations would be helpful so that when they hit the wall in adult life and they're providing for a family, they can think, oh yeah, this is what we used to talk about in school. And it is true that they could say, yeah, but that was different because that was just a theory. That was in my imagination. This is actually boots on the ground. But still, they're better prepared to deal with it because they had gone over it. They could also anticipate when they're in a work situation that they think might uh, an employer that might demand something of them that they don't they don't want to have to do and they might be able to avoid getting in the worst kinds of situations. Um, okay, so this uh, continual reflection, develop and examine life, 
learned how to be a good citizen. Uh, corruption is ultimately self-destructive. So this is what Socrates was charged with. Plato's brothers said to him, Socrates, all of our, our adult mentors are telling us people by nature are greedy and power hungry and irrational. And so we should appear to be just and appear to be virtuous because then we'll get the better jobs. But we don't want to really be that way because our parents want us to make a lot of money and have a lot of power. So they teach us how to create an appearance. We want you, Socrates, to teach us we should love virtue for its own sake, even if nobody's looking, even if nobody cares and we could cheat, even if we get accused of being the bad guy when we're actually the good guy. We want you to convince us we should still love justice for its own sake, just because it's a virtue of the soul, just because you can't flourish without it. Well, I mean, when they say that's very ironic because in the future, Socrates will be the most just and virtuous citizen and he will be accused of corrupting the youth <laughs> and being an atheist. So it can happen. It can happen anywhere. Um, and people should read it and think, when I grow up, am I going to be one of those people who accuses the good guys of being bad because they make me look bad? Um, but Socrates, Plato's writing this because if you want to preserve a democracy, you have to have citizens that will be just and virtuous. Even if nobody's looking, they will teach their children to do that. And even if they get it falsely accused of being the bad guy, um, because in Athens, they didn't. They taught their kids, everybody just cares about money, power, sex, whatever, and they lost their democracy. So democracies are frail. There's lots of ways you can lose them. You can have a weather event. You can have an unjust invasion. You can have a plague. But you should at least have a strong social fabric based on the character, the love of justice and virtue of the citizens. If you lose that, you will lose your democracy, no matter what other good luck you might have. Okay, you have to, so that was a lesson that Plato really wanted to get, um, persuade the Athenians and persuade anyone reading his dialogue. The people who are reading his dialogues have natural ability, motivation, and opportunity. They have privilege. And Plato is saying to us, if you have enough privilege to read my dialogues, you better use that for the well-being of the people over whom you have that authority, or your society will become less stable and your children will have a worse society to live in and a worse life for that reason. So that's the message to everyone. Um, the Indonesian's founders rejected the abuse by the Japanese and just so they needed to reject the same types of corruption between themselves. Um, they shouldn't allow themselves to be exploited by outsiders, especially corporate leaders who want to take their natural resources without paying taxes or cleaning it up. And they should make them rebuild for sustainability. So there's lots and lots of ways that Indonesia's leaders have to be held accountable for not being corrupt and have to not allow themselves to be abused by corrupt um, global capitalists or mostly that's the kind of exploitation Indonesia runs into. Indonesians need to prove that the world, uh, to the world that a society based on the belief in God can develop and become and stay free and open. 
a democracy. They have to model a system for both moral character and intellectual training. So at the moment, 2024, Indonesia has fallen, is not doing well in educating their students and teaching them English and teaching them STEM. They fall behind in relation to Malaysia and other countries. And that's where there shouldn't be a dichotomy between having so much emphasis on religious education, on being a good Muslim at the expense of developing professional expertise. So students sh should want to develop some expertise in the secular world in the context of doing it for promoting democracy in their country, promoting uh, Muhammad, a good Islamic way of life. Muhammad would want them to flourish and to be successful, but to use that for the benefit of everyone. Um, Indonesians need to show the world Muslims are pluralist, tolerant, and they assume it's only possible to be a good Muslim in a free society because then you're choosing to be Muslim without any external motivations of being rewarded or punished for being or not being a Muslim. So that's true of any religion. If you really are authentically and you want your citizens to really be authentically whatever tradition they are, we must collectively decide to be a free and open society. And people with power would never hire or fire or sell a house to somebody or not. They would not discriminate because instantly religion will be corrupted. The most wicked people will sell their soul and say they had a conversion experience. Now will you give me this job or sell me this house? Whereas the people who are really sincere are the ones who get punished. And then politicians who are really corrupt could hide behind their religious belief. So the only way to have good politics and good religion is to keep them separate. If you try to put them together, it corrupts politics. Politicians hide behind religion and it corrupts religion because then wicked people claim to be converted. Um, okay, so the best way for Indonesia to move forward, to be a link, the traditions they have to Aristotle, I think it would strengthen their ability to maintain a free society and to help people flourish. But uh, Americans should try it also, actually. <laughs> we don't follow our own traditions, um, even though we tend to claim that we're superior because of those traditions, but we don't abide by them. Obviously, we don't think greed is the most threatening vice for a free society. America is notoriously promoting greed and destroying our democracy in the meantime. So I think this is true of any society that's worried about developing or maintaining their democracy is that everything I say here is um, true for problems of corruption anywhere. And then you can see how multi-dimensional it is, many different ways to look at it. Um, I, you know, it could have been a much longer um, video about in business, the how much you charge for something, the salaries you pay, the benefits, the whistleblowing laws, there's just whole lots of ways that people's lives can be enriched. They can, and they can go beyond their work life to create more, to flourish in other ways and contribute to the society in other ways. Or you can really undermine people's stability and their ability to even survive, much less flourish and the society just goes down to more and more primitive emotions, driving the culture and the social fabric unravels and 
you end up with a dictator who says they're going to fix it by taking control. So it's very precarious. It always was. Americans don't appreciate uh, what they inherited and they might throw it away in a few months. Let's hope not.